Donna. Uh, so with that, I get the opportunity uh, before Dries starts the Dries note to tell you a little bit about the Drupal Association to give you some updates and highlights uh, and to share with you some things we've been working on. But as we go through, if you have any questions or there's more you wanna know, there are some opportunities to connect with us. We have a Q&A with some Drupal staff and uh, the board as well tomorrow. And we're gonna have some things that are listed in the video library on Vimeo. So if there are any sessions that are led by the Drupal Association that you missed, you can join us there as well. So thank you for participating in DrupalCon. It's day three of our week together to learn connect and build Drupal. As of today, I have a new participant count. So as of today, our numbers went over 2,300. So we've got over 2,300 people here with us at DrupalCon. And of those registered, like I mentioned earlier, about a third of those are attending DrupalCon for the first time. So that's really, really exciting. And I think it's good news for our community that we continue to expand and grow. And I hope that we use this time together to connect as well. So once again this year, moving DrupalCon online had the added benefit of allowing us to dramatically widen our scholarship program efforts. And this year we expanded our outreach to students as well. So if you're students that are with us, say hi in the chat so folks can connect with you. Um, but there are students that are here that wanted to learn more about Drupal and open source. So we welcome you and congratulations to our over 150 scholarship attendees and many, many thanks to our over 40 scholarship mentors. Part of this program was connecting new attendees that, through our scholarship program with a mentor. So folks that have been there, done that with DrupalCon so that we could really maximize the experience and the connection that everyone has. Thank you to these organizations and our local Drupal associations who partnered with us to recruit these new scholarship attendees. So make sure you connect, say hi, say welcome to Drupal. Uh, and to DrupalCon. While our Drupal Association team puts a ton of talent and energy into making DrupalCon happen, we simply couldn't do it without the support and collaboration of our sponsors and contributors. So thank you to all of our DrupalCon sponsors. We truly appreciate your ongoing support of the Drupal project and of the Drupal community. So this is where everyone in chat says, thank you, thank you sponsors. And you look at all the logos and then you go to the expo hall every chance you get and you say hi and thank you. And they give you ideas and prizes and we all get to connect and say, do it again next year so that everybody comes back to sponsor DrupalCon wherever we land in 2022. And this year we had a new category of support, individual sponsors. And so, to be honest, this is something that we've seen some of the local camps do. Amy June talked about the importance of Drupal camps and local events. So we said maybe this idea would work also for DrupalCon. So thank you to those that stepped up and gave a little bit extra as part of their ticket purchase to support this event and in turn support our community's opportunity to gather and collaborate. This year, over half of the contributors supporting DrupalCon programming and summits are new to the DrupalCon team. And for quite a few, this is their first official contribution to the Drupal project. So congratulations to those of you who will get your first contribution credits. And let's take a moment to recognize these DrupalCon contributors. Be sure to say hi in the chat, congratulate them on contributing, thank them for contributing, and appreciate them giving their time and talent. So we give you a lot of Drupal thanks to everyone who stepped up to help us make this happen. So 2021 is a special year for our Drupal community. On January 15th, Drupal celebrated 20 years of community-driven innovation. So happy birthday, Drupal. You're 20, you can't drink yet in the US, but some places you can. You can drive a car. You can definitely contribute code. So congratulations. Many of you shared your Drupal birthday wishes and celebrated with us online. To further celebrate Drupal's 20th birthday, we also launched a new event, Drupal Fest. It's a month long series happening in April right now of virtual events focused on the community, contribution, and the positive impacts made possible by Drupal. We encourage you, the community, to help make DrupalFest fun and to make it even more valuable for everyone 
we really encourage you to host your online events in your local time zones and in your local language whenever possible. So some of you may only know the Drupal Association as the organization that hosts DrupalCon, but we do much more throughout the year. We provide training resources for you and your teams to learn how to contribute to Drupal. We, we collaborate to foster a healthy, diverse, and inclusive community of innovation. And we work to make it easy for organizations to select Drupal as their digital experience platform of choice. So if you need help hiring Drupal talent, finding a job in Drupal, connecting with the right partners, expanding the visibility of your brand, or even managing Drupal security updates more easily, we are here to support you. So our Drupal Association vision, and our vision's our ultimate goal, and that's for a safe, secure, and open web for everyone. We get there through our mission, to accelerate the Drupal project and to support the growth of our Drupal community. In the last half of 2020, we created a three-year strategic roadmap for our work, giving us additional focus about how we meet our mission and provide maximum impact in a positive way for Drupal. So today I'll have a chance to share some highlights around a few of the projects that we've already put into motion to support these strategic goals. In an ideal world, everyone using Drupal would be contributing back to it. I think we can almost all agree on that. And if you don't, we can talk about it. Come to the DA booth and we'll explain why. So interestingly, yesterday I got to listen to Nikhil Deshpande, who's the chief digital officer for the state of Georgia, which is where I live. And he was talking about the imperative for contributing back to Drupal. And he shared a really interesting analogy um, that I hadn't heard before, but just makes a lot of sense. So we were talking about why it's important to contribute. And in this case, we were talking to end user uh, enterprise organizations about why they should think about contributing. And Nikhil said, you know, he was talking about it and he said, you know, we plant trees because we need oxygen. So if we think about Drupal contribution, contributions, the oxygen needed for a thriving Drupal project. Providing recognition for those who do contribute is one of my very favorite things that we get to do at the Drupal Association. So thank you contributors. You'll see here the top 50 individual contributors over the past year. So give them a lot of Drupal thanks in the chat as well. And here are our top organizational contributors for Drupal. So you're all planting trees. Thank you for the Drupal oxygen and for ensuring that we have the ability for Drupal to grow and to innovate. So Drupal's actually a leader in open source when it comes to the system we use to recognize contribution of both individuals and organizations. But there's always room for improvement. So we have been looking at next steps and a couple things that we're working on in the immediate future include implementing a non-code contribution type, not based on issues, that can accommodate community roles that our contributors serve in as well as one-off contributions and activities that take place outside of drupal.org. The next piece we're working on in our roadmap for 2021 is creating dashboards to help the community visualize and understand our contribution ecosystem. So we do contribution recognition, but there are a lot of tools and systems that we either have today or are thinking about for tomorrow to really better enable contribution. Our engineering team's been hard at work to provide the tools and systems that better enable you to contribute and to not just contribute, but to contribute easily so that we can bring more and more people into the project. You can learn more about these projects by watching the drupal.org panel from earlier this week and the recorded content on Vimeo. Uh, you can come to the Dries Note Q&A after this. You can find Tim with me in the, D, the DA Q&A session tomorrow. There are a lot of ways for you to learn about what we're doing. And if you have any questions, please let us know. So you're gonna hear the word contribution a lot this week, and that's not a coincidence. In case you didn't figure out, contribution is a central focus of DrupalCon this week. This year, we made a really conscious decision and, and we took a bit of a risk and made a strategic shift with a significant goal in mind. Each day we focus and each day we contribute. So with Drupal 10 on the horizon, we wanted to rally the community around Drupal's key strategic initiatives. In collaboration with core mentoring coordinators, 
core initiative coordinators, and the DrupalCon program committee, we all work together to evolve the contribution experience at DrupalCon, not only to better support key initiatives, but to better connect participants with how to get involved. We hear time and time again that there's sometimes a willingness to contribute, but no, you don't know where to go. You're not sure who to talk to. You don't know how to break into certain circles to be helpful. So we're hoping that the way that things were structured this week really help you break some of those barriers to contribution. And all of this is done with the ultimate goal of accelerating Drupal project innovation. So thank you to everyone who's already contributed this week. We've seen a lot of new faces in our virtual contribution spaces. And if you're thinking about it, but you're just not sure where to start, this week's the perfect time. You can stop by the contribution booth in the expo hall to get connected and learn about next steps. And for those of you contributing, be sure to share your stories with the hashtag Drupal Contributions. I firmly believe that one of the most effective on-ramps for people to join the Drupal community is through local events. And we actually just heard about this from Amy June as part of her acceptance speech about how that's how she got connected and that's what made such an important impact for her. And to better enable new people to make that local event connection, we really needed to reimagine how events are positioned on Drupal.org. So you may have already seen this, but if you go to the community events listing, you'll notice some major improvements to the community event listing. And this is just the beginning. We're working to bring all Drupal events together, not just DrupalCon events, but everything connected to Drupal event world together at events.drupal.org. We want these connection opportunities to be more visible. We want everyone to find things easy. And if someone's discovering Drupal, we want them to see the scale and the impact of what's happening at a global capacity. We also want to give event organizers the ability to have their events featured in a really prominent way. So thank you to the event organizers working group team who's collaborated with us at the DA to make this happen. We have a lot of work in front of us, but we've got a really clear plan and vision. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, Kaleem wants me to tell all of you hosting local events, get your event posted so that we can share it at drupal.org. So we've done some work in addition to everything that we've talked about so far. We did some work around kind of this idea of strategic strategic contribution and the process of, of getting people connected to the contribution opportunities. Part of that's been done from a non-code experience. So one of the first things we did was update our language. Frankly, we had talked about contribution when we talked about code, and we were starting as a community to say code and non-code and pull it together. But when we said things like DrupalCon volunteer opportunities, promote Drupal volunteer opportunities, we, we were kind of making it a little too muddy. So volunteers are contributors, and we want to emphasize that language because it's, it's just as important that the work's done for non-code contributions as anything else. So non-code contributors, you're contributors, and you're part of our official language. We implemented this year a new strategic contribution process for both DrupalCon North America and Promote Drupal. We started with th those two programs because that's where there's a nice um, a good amount of non-code contribution, but there are also things that we felt like would make good pilots that we could learn from and then scale across the project. So with this updated approach, and frankly, this is nothing new, it's new to Drupal, but it's something that I've personally used in other volunteer organizations and it's been really successful. So I'm super excited to see how it translates to the Drupal community. What we did with this updated approach was provide a more detailed uh, information about the specific opportunities available with both of these programs. We talked about what to expect, uh, the timing and commitment, the skills involved, and then we also talked about what you'll get in return for your contribution. We matched your current skill sets to the right placements so that we could get you the right person doing the right thing, so it felt good for you as a contributor. We also asked, what skill sets you want to develop along the way. And we're working throughout all of our programs to make sure to be able to support that skill development. One really cool thing about the application process update was it allowed us to cast a much wider net. So as I mentioned earlier, over half of our DrupalCon program and Summit contributors were new to the event. And many of those were contributing to Drupal for the first time through these roles. 
So to shift gears just a little bit, I wanna talk about cultivating talent. So there's consistent demand for Drupal talent, and we have an opportunity to cultivate that talent and provide better connections to our community. So this year, we've been talked about it in 2020, but this year it's actually happening and I'm super excited. We've launched a new community-driven program. Discover Drupal's our new initiative to unlock opportunities for people who've been underrepresented in the open source community. This initiative provides training scholarships, internships, mentoring from Drupal community members, and connections to potential employers, helping those students build skills and launch promising careers in open source. We believe the community of people building digital experiences should reflect the people who rely on them every day. So with Discover Drupal, we hope to not only remove some of the barriers for underrepresented students, but we hope to enable better, more relevant digital experiences for millions of people around the world. So if you're as excited about this program as we are, I'd love to hear from you. We're seeking mentors, we're looking for sponsors, both organizational and individual. Um, that sponsor money helps us grow the number of students that can be in this initial cohort for 2021. So it's important, given all the things we're doing, that I take a moment to thank our supporting partners. Funding from these organizations is critical in supporting all of the DrupalCon work that we do, when they're DrupalCon sponsors, but then we shift to all of our non-DrupalCon work and that's where supporting partners come into play. So thank you to our enterprise supporters, our signature supporters, our premium supporters, lots of logos, that's a great thing. Classic supporters, and our community supporters. Thank you. So Dries, you're with me. I wanted I wanted to to have you with me for this for this piece as as I start to wrap up. Um, it was less than a year ago at DrupalCon Global that we paused for eight minutes and forty six seconds to reflect upon violence against Black and Black trans lives, and in particular the violence that caused the death of George Floyd. Um, and just a few days ago, violence took the life of Dante Wright. So. You know, it, it, racism permeates every structure in our society and is deeply embedded in our history. And we thought it was really important today um, to take a moment to, to think about this as a community. So recently there have been escalating violence and ongoing harassment directed at Asians, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders. Um, we stand in solidarity with and in support of these communities and with all people of color who experience marginalism and racism. We stand in solidarity with those of you actively engaged in anti-racist action. And so Dries and I wanted to take a moment uh, with you as our community to reflect on these issues and how they affect the health of our community. So we'll take a moment together now. We recently published a list of resources on drupal.org to support you, our community. You'll find this under the resources link on the drupal.org homepage. As part of this link, you'll also find excellent resource lists created by the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Group. So the Drupal Associations made diversity, equity, and inclusion a priority. And this resource is a small part of an operational DE&I work plan we've been developing. So Dries, I, I know all of these things are as important to you as they are to me um, and that we are working together. You know, all, all of this ties into our organizational strategic plan, uh, which you and the board were part of, of helping to develop in support of Drupal. So we really hope that, you know, these, these things contribute to a healthy Dr Drupal community and, and a stronger Drupal. And with that, uh, to talk more about the direction of, drink, of, of direction and strength of Drupal, I have the pleasure of handing over the stage to Dries for the ever popular Dries Note presentation. So Dries, th thanks for being with me there for, for that moment of reflection. And, and we look yeah. forward to hearing everything you wanna share in the Dries Note. Awesome, yeah, of course. Yeah, that was very important uh, for both of us. So thank you, uh, Heather. Well, let's do the Dries Note. Um, First of all, for those people that don't know me, um, my name is Dries. I am the founder of Drupal. I started Drupal 20 years ago, as Heather explained, and uh, 
um, the project lead. And so I'm excited to be here today with you. And we have a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. I'm also going to talk about falling in love with Drupal. And lastly, I want to talk a lot about getting off the island. So maybe a little bit mysterious, but um, you'll find out more in a minute. Um, so let's start with Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. Um, but first, I wanted to say a few words about the pandemic. Obviously, um, you know it's been a difficult time for many. Uh, various people in the project have lost family or friends uh, to COVID. I, too, actually lost a family member um, just a couple of weeks ago. And so it's definitely a difficult and devastating time. Uh, but also as a project, we lost, uh, you know, Ben uh, Chabot uh, due to COVID. He's he's been a long-term contributor to Drupal. So, um, you know, I wish we could be in person uh, for DrupalCon, and uh, it would have been in my hometown, uh, Boston. But unfortunately, until we have the virus under control, it's just not a good idea. So, uh, also excited to do the event virtual uh, because it is more inclusive and more accessible uh, that way as well. Uh, I hope you all stay healthy. Uh, of course, the fastest way to getting back on track and, and meeting in person and having Drupal cons in person is you know, COVID vaccines, right? Um, and guess what? Uh, three out of four companies that have a vaccine actually use Drupal for their websites. Uh, the fourth one is Ast AstraZeneca and they use Adobe Experience Manager. Uh, maybe they'll use Drupal at some point. However, the University of Oxford, who developed their vaccine, you know, for AstraZeneca, actually does use Drupal. Um, so, in many ways, um, a lot of Drupal being used all around uh, by organizations that, you know, help, um, you know, help us fight COVID nineteen. And um, I wanted to call it out because it actually makes me proud. You know, it, it makes me proud to see that those kinds of organizations, organizations which, you know, frankly, are saving millions of people, you know, um, actually use Drupal. And, um, and that we, as a Drupal community, can sort of indirectly support them. You know, obviously, we support these things in a small and indirect way, but it's still something to be proud of, I think, as, as a community. So um, there's also lots of other organizations using Drupal. There's another great example. It's the Empire State Buildings website. Um, a building that everybody knows in the world, right? And uh, they're actually using COVID, um, you know, and the closures around COVID to do some renovations on the building, including sort of the famous observatory at the top of the Empire State Building. And they decided they needed a, a new website to match those renovations. And so very cool that the Empire State Building's website runs on Drupal as well. So when we get to travel again, and you find yourself in New York uh, with friends or family or something, make sure to point to the Ent Empire State Building and uh, to tell your friends and family that their site runs on Drupal. And uh, if you're a contributor to Drupal, and hopefully you know many of you will become contributors this week, uh, you can even say that you helped uh, you know, make their website in a way, right? So um, pretty cool. Um, you know, lots and lots of websites are actually starting to use uh, Drupal 9 as well. Uh, we released Drupal 9 just like 10 months ago, so not even a year ago. And uh, as you can see from the screenshots on the screen, uh, a lot of websites like NATO or the Paris Tourism website or the World Wildlife Fund or Budweiser, if you like a beer, or Red Hat or an IBM, uh, you know, these are all the kinds of organizations that have um, adopted Drupal 9 already. And um, the big reason is that Drupal 9 obviously comes with new great features, but also that it's been easy to upgrade. Um, a lot of these websites were already using Drupal and have recently upgraded to Drupal 9. And one actually really cool example is uh, Pack 12 um, Not all of you may know Pack 12 but if you live in North America, you probably do. It's a well-known college sports network, I would describe it. Um, and they have like websites and TV stations and mobile apps. And they literally, you know, follow a lot of sports teams and they, you know, broadcast thousands of hours of TV and video 
and often also through their website. And they really use Drupal in a pretty strategic and really cool way. Um, it's really like the core publishing platform for so many things that they do. Like for example, uh, when you watch TV, you watch their games on TV, at the bottom of the screen, you have this you know, thicker, I guess, I don't know what to call it, where text scrolls left to right. And uh, that content is actually pushed to these TVs, if you will, through Drupal, right? So Drupal is a content backend for all of that. But even the schedule on your TV, if you look at the program guide or whatever you want to call that, because sports are you know, fluid, I guess, they can run over. Um, they constantly have to adjust these schedules and push them uh, sort of in real time to your TVs. And even the schedule management uh, is all done by Drupal. Uh, and then obviously they have their mobile apps, et cetera, et cetera. So if you think about it, it's um, lots of traffic, uh, but also very complex. You know, It's a complex digital experience platform that way. And I was talking to them not too long ago, and they were telling me about how their migration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, which they did uh, a while back, obviously, uh, actually took over five months and it required a team of people. I think they said five to six people, program management, project management, consultants, uh, it took five plus months. And then more recently, they've also upgraded from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9. And they were telling me it actually took uh, less than two months and it only took one developer. What an amazing story. And this is obviously for a very, very complex website. So um, if we actually look at some data here, uh, it's something that I've shown in the past, but we kind of measure how long it takes to go from zero websites to 60,000 websites. And as you can see on this slide, it took Drupal 7, seven months, Drupal 8, three months, and Drupal 9, just one month to get to 60,000 websites in production. And so obviously, um, you know, faster than ever. Uh, which is really, really exciting. Um, another data point that we could actually look at is sort of the readiness of the contributed modules. And on this slide, you actually see some data from way back when, 2017. And I showed this data in my Dries note uh, in Baltimore, 2017. And what we looked at here is the readiness of the top 50 modules, the most used modules, the top 50 most used, used modules. And um, and we showed this 17 months after the launch of Drupal 8. And this is where we stood at the time. And so as you can see, roughly a third of the top 50 modules were ready after 18 months after the release. And roughly two thirds of the modules were not ready, right? They were either in final testing or still under development. Now, if you compare that to today's state, it looks something like this. Um, you can instantly see it's a lot better. Uh, obviously, very important to know too is that the timelines don't match, right? We're comparing 17 months to 10 months uh, since Drupal 9. Uh, and that's a big difference, but that's the data that we have. Um, and again, it's already looking a lot better. Like 90% of the top 50 modules are basically ready to go. And that's why it makes it so easy to start upgrading uh, your websites, right? And the reason why so many modules are ready, just as a reminder, is because of some of the key changes that we've made in how we develop Drupal and release Drupal. You know, we no longer break um, sort of the world between major versions. We make sure there is an upgrade path and backwards compatibility. And as a result, upgrades are no longer hard. And um, you also constantly get new improvements and new innovations every six months, and people really like it. Um, and it's been a huge, huge success, as you can see, you know, based on this data, nine months after the release of Drupal 8. And so it's something that we all worked really hard on and that we should be really proud of as well. Now, if you expand out from 50 modules to more modules, it looks something like this. Uh, and again, you can see that as a whole, the project is much more stable. Upgrades are going to be much more easy, and things are looking really, really well. And you know, it's even going to get better. Uh, we're currently working on Drupal 10. Uh, our target release date is the summer of 2022. So next summer, it's over a year away. Uh, and we're working on five major initiatives. Um, 
I'm going to talk about these real quick. I know you're learning about them uh, already this week, and you'll learn more about it later these weeks. Uh, but we feel really good about these initiatives, first of all. Um, we picked them for a reason. Uh, we had surveys, and we collected feedback, and we looked at what we have to do as a project. And you know, all of these things combined led us to picking those five initiatives. So let's take a closer look. I'll go relatively quick because you have these initiative days uh, this week, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail. But let's start with decoupled uh, menus. Um, all right, so a lot of great progress on the coupled menus. You may have learned about all of that yesterday. We've got a lot of things done. Uh, we can now have JavaScript projects on Drupal.org. We figured out how to publish um, JavaScript to NPM. Uh, we have built proof of concepts. We created menu components, uh, things like that. And currently, we're working on um, you know, making some changes to Drupal's APIs or some additions to Drupal APIs as well as writing uh, documentation uh, for the solution that we've uh, come up with. So looking really good, uh, really encouraged by the coupled menus. Obviously, it's very strategic to kind of branch out to the whole JavaScript world and all of the frameworks and the innovation that's happening in the JavaScript world. And it continues to you know, solidify Drupal as a leader for headless and decoupled. And you know, we'll extend that leadership. Uh, I think we'll have something here with the coupled menus that no other headless uh, content management system has. You know, it will be easier than our competitors. So, uh, really, really cool. Um, you know, next we're going to look at easy out of the box, uh, which actually is today's initiative day. Um, we've made some good progress as well. We added Claro as beta. Um, I would say we've made limited progress around media and layout builder. A lot of great planning, a lot of great ideation and ideas, uh, but we really need some more help moving these things forward. And so I'm hopeful that we can, um, you know, do that today. Uh, we'll be sprinting and collaborating this afternoon, and hopefully we can push some of these things uh, forward. Um, all right, automated updates is our third initiative, and this one looks you know very green i would say uh, we've got a bunch of things done we can actually do automated updates now uh, for drupal 7 and drupal 8 through a contributed module uh, which is pretty cool it's not um it's not built for a composer if you will um, but we've learned a lot from building these uh, you know modules and we're now taking all of these learnings and applying them to drupal 9 and uh, we're adding automated update support to drupal 9 core and we're doing it for composer-based you know, sites, obviously, because that's the go-to way um, in Drupal 9. Um, we're working on the readiness check API. We're working on even better um, signature verification to make sure that these updates are, are you know, not compromised with, uh, so to speak. So lots of good progress. There's been a lot of great momentum. Um, you know, we could use more help. And tomorrow, we'll be working on automated updates. Uh, fourth, um, we'll be talking about Drupal 10 readiness. This one is just ginormous. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I colored it yellow, but um, it doesn't really communicate well the amount of progress and activity that we're seeing around this initiative. Like we got PHP 8 on, we're now Symfony 5 compatible. We've migrated from Composer 1 to Composer 2. We've updated the um, upgrade status module for Drupal 10. And we're working through Symfony 6 even, CK Editor 5. It's a hard migration because of API changes with CK Editor. And we've already made some progress too on the jQuery UI removal. I colored it yellow only because we need to uh, keep up that activity and that momentum, uh, possibly even increase it. And it's an important initiative because a lot of this work is around making sure that Drupal uses the latest and the greatest uh, components that we depend on, and sometimes for security re reasons, or often for security re reasons. And so we really need to re really need to get this done in order to release Drupal 10. And if we don't get it done, we may actually have to push the Drupal 10 release date. Um, you know. In, in order to allow for more time. So that's the Drupal 10 readiness. Again, a lot of great momentum 
very grateful for all of the activity that's been happening. Um, last but not least, we have a new front-end theme for Drupal. We don't have a sprint day for it today, uh, this week, I should say, but I feel like some really great progress has been made here as well. It's actually in core as beta right now. And you know, there's work left to be done, uh, bug fixes, a lot of, uh, of them around the accessibility uh, of um, Oliveira, which is obviously very important. Uh, but this one we can definitely get done if we you know, find some people to uh, help us with these uh, accessibility uh, fi features or bugs. Um, so looking pretty good. So overall, I would say we've made a lot of great progress. Uh, a lot of activity, as I mentioned. Um, I would also say that Drupal 10 is probably closer than it appears. I mentioned we're targeting the summer of next year. Um, but that does mean we have to keep working on all of these initiatives in order to get them done, right? And so that's actually a good segue to this slide, which shows you some of the key milestones or key planned dates that we have in mind right now. Uh, so we've about two weeks left to get things into Drupal 9.2. Uh, and after that, we have the Drupal 9.3 development cycle. And that cycle runs until the uh, October of this year, basically. Uh, and probably our best chance to get things into Drupal 10. Um, you can see that there is a development cycle after Drupal 9.3 as well, uh, towards the bottom there of the screen. Um, but it may not your best chance to get things into Drupal 10 because at some point we need to switch gears and we need to start focusing on getting ready for Drupal 10, which means you know focusing on removing deprecations, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I would say that this year uh, and 9.3 specifically is a really important timeline, uh, time frame for us in order to make progress uh, towards Drupal 10. So if you're thinking about contributing to Drupal and Drupal 10 specifically, now is kind of the time. So please keep that timeline in mind. It increases your chances of getting uh, really cool new features into uh, Drupal 10. Uh, real quick, some um, other important dates for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. These are mostly reminders. We have a lot of new people, so I did want to um, remind people uh, of those dates. But the top, you can see that Drupal 7 is supported until the, until the end of next year, and that we have commercial support after that. Uh, and you can also see that Drupal 8 uh, is end of life later this year. Now, uh, you may wonder why Drupal 7 is supported longer than Drupal 8. It's a very good question. And the reason is that the upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 or Drupal 9 uh, is a difficult upgrade. You know, we've talked about that. We definitely acknowledge that it's hard and we wanted to do the right thing. You know, we wanted to do the right thing for our users and give them additional time so they can upgrade from Drupal 7 to hopefully Drupal 9. Uh, and as we talked about, the upgrade from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 is a lot easier, as I've shown with the Pack 12 example. And so please keep those timelines in mind. Um, plan accordingly, because if you're on Drupal 8, you have to get to Drupal 9 before the end of the year. And if you're an agency or a Drupal shop, also help your customers plan accordingly. Um, that will keep everybody secure and safe. Um, you know, overall, I would say we've made a lot of great progress uh, towards Drupal 10. I feel like we're working on the right initiatives. And so really, let's continue the momentum that we have with these initiatives and try to get as many features uh, ready by Drupal 10. Um, I want to thank all of the individual contributors that have helped or contributed to Drupal. Uh, since last June, since that release of Drupal 9. So in just 10 months or so, we've had over a 1,100 people contribute, which is absolutely amazing and fantastic. Um, I also want to recognize the sponsors that are behind many of these people, not all of them, um, but about two thirds of all of the contributions are sponsored. Um, and so far, again, sort of in the last 10 months since the release of Drupal, um, you know, nine, we had 365 
organizational contributors as well. And this slide actually shows the logos of the top 100 contributors. And just as a, a little FYI or fun fact, uh, all of them have made at least five contributions to Drupal 9, and many have made many more contributions to Drupal 9. So thank you as well uh, to the sponsors behind all of the individual contributors. So now is a quick update on the state of Drupal 9 and our plans for Drupal 10 and how we're doing. Next, I wanted to talk about uh, falling in love with Drupal. Um, I know that's a little bit mysterious, but um, let's get into it. So these five initiatives that I've presented, as I mentioned, I feel like they're really great um, and important, uh, but you may have noticed that there is like a sixth pillar here. And uh, I often ask myself, what else should we be doing? You know, what else do we need to do to, you know, help Drupal grow and make Drupal even more successful? And there's many opinions and many options. There's many things that we could do and should be doing. Um, but how do we narrow it down to one specific thing? And uh, that's not an easy task. And what I wanted to try and do today is, you know, make a recommendation and help us align on what else we need to do. Uh, but before I make my recommendation, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the state of Drupal and provide you some context for why I think we need to do what I'll propose uh, in just a few minutes. Now, if you were to ask, you know, 20 Drupal users, if you will, what is the most important strength of Drupal? You most likely would get 20 different answers. And sometimes, those people will probably need 20 minutes to explain it to you, right? Because, you know, it's like, this is great and that is great and here's why it's great. And um, the point here is that there isn't always a focused answer and there isn't always a simple answer. And for some, that means that Drupal's identity might not be clear, that maybe we've even lost our way a bit. And it might also help explain why it might be hard to align on what the most important thing to work on is. And so I believe we need to give every user, every individual, every organization, and even every contributor a very clear reason as to why they should adopt Drupal, right? And this actually made me think because a few years ago, I was a uh, at a private conference, actually, at a conference. And uh, Sachin Nadella was sort of the keynote speaker. And uh, he was being interviewed at this conference. It was like a Q&A. And the interviewer talked about how Microsoft had lost its way a little bit when Sachin Nadella became the CEO of Microsoft and had really big shoes to fill. Like, in a way, he stepped into the shoes of not just Steve Ballmer, but also Bill Gates, you know, both very iconic leaders. And yet, Sachin Adela did sort of the unimaginable and was successful at reinvigorating Microsoft, if you will. And um, the interviewer asked him in this interview how he did that. And he gave an answer, and this is a few years ago, that was really interesting to me, and I, I, I haven't forgotten that answer. And so I found a video clip where he answers the same question. It was not at the same conference that I was at, but he answers the same question. And so I wanted to play you uh, this video. So let's take a look. I needed to sort of go back, in fact, to the very origin of the company, right? I mean, Microsoft got started uh, when we built, or Paul and Bill built uh, the basic interpreter for the Altair. Um, and I believe that everything that needs to be known about Microsoft in 2019 can be traced back to our origin, uh, which is we build technology so that others can build more technology, right? I felt like we were doing things out of envy and others. We needed to get back to what we, our core identity is, right? Especially in 2019, where every company is a software company around the world, uh, we can just basically be a software platform and tools provider and have a good business. And so I felt, let's be proud of who we are. Of course, we've got to express it differently. Uh, and, and then, you know, really reinforce that. That's why we talk about our mission around empowering people and organizations. 
And so I thought that was a really, you know, interesting interview. If you're interested, you can watch a longer version uh, of this interview uh, online. But uh, basically, you know, Microsoft was sort of reinvigorating by refocusing on their roots. And, you know, in the interview, actually, Sachin Adele explains how he interviewed people that had been uh, at Microsoft for like 20 years and what they answered. And there was a whole process around how they kind of you know, determine what their roots are and what it meant to going back to their roots. Uh, and ultimately it meant building technologies um, or technology so that others can build more technology. And then if you look at that through the lens of what they've done recently, like, you know, they've been investing so much in Azure as an example, but they've also bought GitHub as another example, like all of their moves or many of their moves are really rooted in this notion of becoming, uh, you know, or re-becoming, if that's a word, um, a company around building and builders again, right? And um, it's been very successful, I would say. And so that made me think about what would it mean for Drupal to return to its roots? Because it feels from observing Microsoft as an example, that that is a very powerful thing to do and that it can really help like strengthen your focus or accelerate your momentum or provide clarity to a lot of people, right? And so um, I thought that was a really interesting question. It got me to think like, um, you know, what would it take for, um, you know, or what did it take for you to fall in love with Drupal? Um, and maybe take a moment to answer that question for yourself. And I don't mean like falling in love with Drupal after a year or two years, but like, what was it that spiked your interest in the early or in the beginning? And what caused that feeling of sort of excitement, the first feeling of excitement? And, you know, when I asked people and I asked others to ask people as well, uh, you know, Angie did a tweet about it, for example. Um, what we've learned is that there was actually a fairly consistent theme in those answers. You know, not one theme necessarily, but there was definitely a very strong theme in those answers. And the theme was that Drupal's roots are about empowering side builders. You know, it, and typically these side builders are less technical. Um, they want to build things through the UI, and they and they when they discovered Drupal, they felt empowered. They felt like they could do things that they could otherwise not do. And we also heard that they love Drupal because they could do, you know, sort of ambitious things, you know, things that are maybe more complex and more powerful than they could do with other tools. You know, this notion of ambitious websites that we've talked about uh, so much. And they could do all of this with sort of a low code or no code or whatever you want to call it, minimum code. Um, and that's important nuance too, because, you know, a lot of frameworks, you have to use a lot of code that don't allow kind of this assembly of, of websites, right? Uh, and then maybe on the other hand, you have SaaS solutions and they don't allow you to write any code at all. So there's this kind of in the middle low code thing where you can write some code or a lot of code if you want to, but the fact that you can do so much through a UI, but then also, where needed, make customizations with, you know, limited code, like maybe an alter hook or something, is really powerful. And um, I actually believe that a lot of sort of Drupalists, and you know, here are some familiar faces, um, that that's how they actually fell in love with Drupal. You know, the feeling of feeling empowered and uh, being able to get things done uh, very quickly and easily through the UI. And uh, I think it's a story a lot of people. I was talking to Tim, for example. He's the CTO of the Drupal Association, and he's an English major, didn't study computer science, but he fell in love with Drupal because it allowed him to build these websites quickly and even to make some money uh, to help pay for college. Or, you know, we just saw Amy June, for example, and she talked about how she was a nurse and she was also a Volkswagen mechanic and a school teacher and she's a mom, uh, but she's not a computer scientist by professional training. Yet uh, she's done amazing things with Drupal and she's doing amazing things 
uh, for the community. Congratulations, by the way. Um, and, you know, I think there is that element, again, of empowering people to allow them to do great things quickly with limited code. Um, and if that's Drupal's core strength, I do feel like uh, maybe, unfortunately, the site builder has been the forgotten user. We haven't really focused that much on this persona. We've done a lot of for the developers, and we've been focused on content authors, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe, unfortunately, the site builder is the forgotten user. And truth to be told, I think our modernization efforts you know, added some complexity. Uh, whether it's object-oriented programming, Composer, Symfony, and they added some complexity that disadvantaged the site builder. And to be clear, all these things have been great for Drupal. They've really empowered backend developers. They helped us actually evolve how we do releases and how we do uh, upgrades, and these upgrades have become much easier, and all of that is part of adopting these technologies. But at the same time, despite many of the great things about it, it has disadvantaged the site builder. For example, you hear sometimes that you need to have a backend developer on call or on staff when you use Drupal 8 or Drupal 9 because the upgrades are more complex now. And obviously, we're trying to fix that with automated updates. But it's an example of how Drupal has become more complex. Uh, and I don't think anyone is, is arguing against that become more complex specifically for site builders. Um, and having that great site builder experience uh, for less technical people is really important and really valuable uh, because I believe everybody benefits from that. You know, Whether you're a small organization or a large organization, um, we all benefit from that. And sometimes people think that those ideas around site builders are incompatible with enterprise users, for example. But that's not true. Uh, again, everybody benefits from the productivity improvements that site builder uh, capabilities provide, like WYSIWYG and drag and drop. And I uh, also believe it extends Drupal's relevancy uh, for all of these audiences. So with all of that said, um, if our roots are the site builder, and if there's value in going back to our roots, um, you know, we should focus on the site builder experience. And then the question becomes how? What do we have to do uh, to improve that site builder experience? And so that's what I want to talk about, right? Um, what would we do? If we could do one thing, what would it be? Um, there's probably uh, 50 great ideas. But the way I think the thought about it is we want to focus on something that allows these ambitious experiences to be built with low code. That's one. Two, as we think about what we could do, I think it's really valuable to um, you know, expose this early in people's Drupal journey. You know, it's something like something that people see in the first 10, 15 minutes and that makes them feel empowered. So early in their Drupal journey, I think is an important attribute. And then lastly, I think we need to do something that's relatively small, that's doable, because we already have a lot of things on our plate. Core committers are doing a lot of things. And so I think we need to find something that's relatively small. Hopefully, we can do as a contributed module, but still has a very high impact on the project, right? So these are some criteria. And that got me to think about, you know, what's the first thing that all people do after installing Drupal, probably installing a contributed module, right? And um, I think we take for granted how hard that can be. Uh, I think in our minds, it, it looks something like this. Um, but in reality, if you actually observe what people have to do, they have to do all of these different steps. Um, it's quite complex, actually, um, to find your module, to figure out if it's going to work on your site, to then install it. And, and so that initial experience of finding a contributed module and getting it installed might not be love at first sight, you know, pun intended here. Um, because the first problem that people run into is finding the module on Drupal.org, which can be hard to navigate, can be hard to decide which module should I use. 
The second problem that many people run into is composer. You know, as powerful and awesome that composer is, uh, it doesn't make installing a module easy for site builders. Uh, and so I believe we can make this easier. And so what I would like to propose, and by the way, this is not a new idea. Uh, what I would like to propose is that we work on a project browser. And a project browser would be functionality that ships with Drupal core. It's part of the Drupal admin UI, and it allows you to browse all of the modules available for Drupal, you know, thousands of modules, make it easy to find them, and that makes it really easy to install them as well. With one click or two clicks, you can install a module. And the reason I really like this is because, again, it's something that people get exposed to early in their journey. It's one of the first thing you wanna do, uh, but it could really provide this instant and seamless discovery of modules and experimentation. And I think people would feel really empowered if they can very easily and quickly kind of install some modules, right? Um, but it also makes so much sense, it almost hurts. <laughs> Meaning like, imagine you're an iPhone user or, or you know, it doesn't matter, a smartphone user, but let's go with the iPhone. Uh, if you want to install an app on your iPhone, um, you don't go to you don't go to your desktop, open a browser, navigate to apple.com, you know, find your app, download your app, and then figure out a way to transfer the app from your desktop to your iPhone. I mean, that's not how you do things. What you do is you open up the app store, you know, which is kind of the equivalent of the project browser, and you find your you know app and you know, Apple makes great recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you install an app on your iPhone. And it should be that easy to install a module on Drupal. And in fact, it's, you know, table stakes. If you look at our competitors in the, or some of our competitors in the content management space, they all have it. You know, WordPress has one, Wix and Squarespace, and you can see the install buttons and the add buttons, and some of these screenshots. And in fact, even some of our own modules like the web form module. They've kind of built their own app store just for the web forms um, ecosystem of add-ons, which um, you know goes to show that a lot of people really see benefit in this and, and, and even module owners are going uh, through the effort to build um, you know, project browsers for their extension. So uh, I also think now is the time. I think we have a lot of the infrastructure in place uh, thanks to Things like the update status module, but also automated updates. You know, we have package signing, we have package endpoints, we have project feeds, we have composer. Uh, I won't go into all of the details what these things are, but the point is, we've actually put together over the last few years a lot of the infrastructure that you need to build a project browser, and so I feel like we might be able to build it, you know, relatively quickly or easily. There's actually already a project browser module that might or might not be a good starting point. Um, we can build it in Contrib, and when it's ready, um, hopefully we can move it into core, you know? And I think it would be a great first step. Now, will it make for the best possible site builder experience in the world? No, we need to do more, right? But this would be a first great step. And after we've taken this step, we can do many more things. So that's what I would like to propose. Um, what I'm going to do is I'd like to create an initiative team. You know, how do you make this actionable, right? I'd like to formalize an initiative team. So if you're interested in helping with this, um, we have an issue for this already. Uh, you can find the number here on the screen. I'll share my slides uh, today or tomorrow as well. Um, put your name on the issue queue if you're interested in being part of the initiative team. And then we'll kick off weekly meetings. And uh, I'll probably run them until we have the initiative team uh, formalized. Um, but we're going to kick it off. Uh, keep an eye out for more updates, either on my blog and Drupal.org as well, of course. And uh, yeah, let's see if we can get this going. And as I mentioned, there's many other steps, other things we can do. Like personally, I think improving the UX of a lot of the site builder uh, capabilities that we have in Drupal, whether it's views or entities and fields or configuration management or even paragraphs module as a contributed module uh, would help a lot as well. But they're going to take 
more time, a different approach, maybe more resources more likely. And that might be a better thing to focus on like for Drupal 11 or something. But for Drupal 10, I think we may have a shot at making some progress at a great uh, project browser. And that would really transform um, you know, how we think about the site builder persona uh, to making things uh, a lot better for them. And it would be great to attract new people to Drupal by you know, catching them early on, if you will, and making them feel really empowered about Drupal and what they could do with Drupal. And I don't know, I'm just excited about it. So um, let's try and make it happen. Um, all right, so that's actually the end of section two. Um, there is one section remaining. Uh, which is about getting off the island. You may be wondering, what does that mean, getting off the island? So let me start to explain. But first, I'd like to you know, begin here and basically acknowledge that we have built something really amazing here. You know, We have one of the most scalable, robust, and mature development communities in the world. We have over 10,000 people collaborating on Drupal um, every year. We have over 1,200 organizations contributing to Drupal every year. I mean, our scale is amazing. And there's not many organizations that have the kind of scale and collaboration that Drupal has. Um, and to make this kind of collaboration possible, like how do you work together with 10,000 people? You know, we had to put in place a lot of different things. We had to put in place a very modular architecture in Drupal itself, but also um, really powerful collaboration tools and processes and testing systems and much more. And it's impressive what we've done, I think. Um, you know, lots of people have helped with this. And as I said, very, very few organizations have our level of rigor and discipline, excuse me, and sophistication and a lot of organizations look up to us. Other open source projects look up to us about what we've done. Um, and what people may not realize is that we had to build a lot of the tooling, the tooling on Drupal.org on our own. You know, we had to build these things ourselves because GitLab or GitHub, they simply didn't exist. Uh, when I started Drupal 20 years ago, um, we actually started by emailing each other patches. We were using CVS for those that remember and people would create a patch and email it to me, to me personally. And uh, uh, that was fun for a while, but it stopped scaling. Uh, and so at that point we decided like, hmm, maybe we should set up a mailing list and we can email patches to the mailing list. And that was awesome for a while and that stopped scaling. And then we said, well, let's maybe move it to Drupal.org. And we started building the project module uh, where we could have hundreds of projects. Now we have, you know, I think 42,000 or something projects. And we gave every project an issue queue or a ticketing system. And we built all of these things because again, GitLab or GitHub just didn't exist. And maybe we've even, you know, inspired those projects or companies uh, to take some of our ideas. Now, um, but that's all cool and nice, but obviously today, um, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense anymore to build and maintain our own collaboration tools, right? GitLab and GitHub have become massive, successful, like crazy successful, and they've become the standard way of doing things. Most developers use these tools on a daily basis. It's they know them inside out. It's how they work, and the GitLab and GitHub organizations are also extremely well funded. Um, and what that means is that they're innovating much faster than we, the Drupal project, could innovate our tools on our own, right? So uh, it doesn't make any sense for us to keep building and maintaining these tools. And so a few years ago, we set out on this journey to modernize our tools by adopting GitLab. Uh, we picked GitLab because it's open source versus, you know, GitHub is, is not open source, even though Git is. Um, and we collaborated with GitLab. They even made some changes to GitLab to accommodate uh, Drupal, which is fantastic. And, and all of this work um, has been done by the Drupal Association. Uh, the Drupal Association has an engineering team. Uh, it's small but mighty. Um, 
it's honestly one of the best engineering teams I've ever seen in my career. And they do a lot of different things, not just this, they have to juggle, uh, you know, various different priorities, but, uh, you know, they're small but mighty and they've delivered on adding, you know, some of GitLab, let's say, and, and through that, they've given us really cool new key features like in-browser editing and merge requests, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, many of us, we love it <laughs> because it's already um, a lot better and more powerful than anything, uh, you know, we built ourselves before. Uh, but despite a lot of these great improvements um, that allow us to collaborate and contribute better, it's still very difficult for new people uh, to make code contributions uh, to Drupal. And uh, we actually tend to scare people away sometimes because it's so hard to get started with Drupal and to contribute to Drupal. And that's what I want to talk a little bit more about in the remainder of my keynote. And I also picked this topic because, you know, this DrupalCon is about contribution, like where we have the initiative days and contribution afternoons. And so I felt it was right to dedicate a good part of my keynote to this. Uh, but I want to what I want to do for the remainder of this keynote is, is one, show you how people expect to contribute, two, show you how people are actually contributing to Drupal today, specifically new people, and then three, talk about how we're going to make that easier. So in order to do the first thing, to show you how people expect to contribute. Let's say you've never contributed to Drupal and you're trying to contribute for the first time as hopefully many of you are doing this week. Um, you know, we'll show you that it's not always easy, but before we show you that, I wanted to show you what people expect to do. And in order to do so, um, you know, Matthew Grasmick actually created a little video that shows that experience. And so let's play that video now you what my symphony contribution experience was like and point out some of the things that I think made it really great. At the time I was working with symphony console and I ran into a bug with the progress bar. So I decided to go to packages to start since I had used composer to download symphony. Uh, I typed in symphony slash console the same way I could type in Drupal slash Drupal or Drupal core. Went to it, quickly found the GitHub uh, page for this. And because I've used GitHub before, I'm signed in with my GitHub account. Uh, I knew that I could just type in the file name where I had identified the bug locally, take a look at it, click on the edit button and make a change. So uh, in this case, I copy and pasted some code from my local machine. I'm not gonna do that right now, but let's say I wanted to add a comment somewhere to Show an example of an easy change. I'm just gonna add test here. Propose the change that makes a commit. It also uh, created a fork for me automatically, created a branch for me automatically. Uh, I'm gonna hit create pull request. Looks easy. Let's do it. And I saw this. It said, hey, thanks for your pull request. We love contributions, but this is actually a subtree split. It's read only. Don't contribute here. Contribute over at symphony slash symphony. Okay, my mistake, but I learned from it quickly. I headed over to symphony slash symphony and I decided to do the same thing. Uh, I, first of all, I, I switched to the branch that I wanted to make the change on. I typed in the name of the file where I had identified the bug, clicked edit, I copy and pasted some changes over. In this case, my change is so small in the example that I'm just going to type it, propose the change, and pressed uh, create pull request. And I was greeted with some nice things. Uh, for one, I have helpful resources here like uh, contribution guide, code of conduct, security policy, that sort of thing. Uh, I also have a template that's a markdown table that's been provided for me. And it asks me some things that I'm I can answer really quickly. I did answer really quickly. So I'm gonna say the branch is 5.2. You know, it's a bug. It's not a feature. There's no deprecations that I'm aware of. I didn't make an issue first. It's nice, this says that's fine. Don't make an issue, just, just put the description below. It's a bug fix, I don't need docs. Uh, and then I wrote a description. Uh, in this case though, I'm gonna just remove that, do test, 
and uh, press create pull request. So there are a few interesting things that happened that I'd like to point out. Um, one is that a reviewer was automatically added. This, uh, this user, Robin Chalice, was added because he's the code owner of this particular part of the code. Uh, it's an interesting concept I wasn't aware of in GitHub. Labels were automatically added, that it's a bug. Um, I presume that's based on the table I filled out. It needs review. And also, a helpful bot commented and said, hey, I see this is your first PR, welcome. Here's a contribution guide, here are some tips. Uh, go ahead and take a look and make sure the status checks aren't failing and then someone will review it and approve it. Go ahead and sit back and wait for reviews. Cheers. I thought that was really great. I'm going to pan over really quickly to look at um, the real pull request that I submitted because there's a couple things there that you won't find here. So it's, you can see I made a few contributions since then. Uh, but inside of the real pull request, after a couple days of the assigned reviewer not actually reviewing it, the bot came back and it said, hey, there's another person that recently worked on this code. Let's ping them. Maybe they can help review. It turns out they weren't actually the person that reviewed it either, but someone else came in. They started collaborating. Uh, I worked on tests and eventually I got it merged. Um, something that's also not visible here, but it's visible on open pull requests is uh, the status of these things. It's very easy for me when there's a failing test to figure out what's failing and look at the log output. So for instance, uh, you know, you can see who's waiting to review it, but on GitHub, I can also see all of Symfony's various tests. I can see what's failing. Uh, I remember when I first uh, submitted a Travis test had failed. So I went in and I looked at the Travis build, got the output, great interface for this. Um, this is something I've always struggled with with Drupal Core is figuring out like what test is failing, where are the tests, how do I reproduce it, where is the log output. And that's about it. You know, all in all, uh, this change was merged. I've uh, had two other changes merged since then. They've been released uh, and it was a really easy process. So I'm continuing to contribute to Symfony. Awesome. Um... Pretty cool video. There's a lot to like. I think you know one of the parts that I really liked is where um, the bot basically automatically knows who the maintainers of that component, let's say, and, and makes that person a reviewer. And when the reviewer isn't responsive, another bot or maybe it's the same bot basically looks up the name of the person that was the last person to change the same line of code that Matthew was trying to change and automatically recommended that person to be a reviewer. And so, you know, lots of little or not so little features that uh, make that experience of contributing, um, you know, really, you know, intuitive and pleasant. Uh, but these examples aside, I think the real point is because GitHub and GitLab are used by, you know, most developers, it's how people expect things to work. You know, it's how open source works today. And it's what people come to expect. So um, in the second video, we're going to see Matthew again. And he's going to contribute to Drupal, right? Instead of contributing to Symfony, uh, he's going to contribute to Drupal. And um, we're going to show that as well. And the entire video is actually too long, so I can't show it in full. Uh, but I will post a full video on my personal blog. And what I'll show you now is a video of Matthew contributing to Drupal, sort of, you know, the shortened version of that. So let's play that video. I to contribute to Drupal core using the same set of assumptions that I use to contribute to Symfony and see how it goes. All right, so just like when I was contributing to Symfony, I'm gonna start at packages.org because of course I installed Dr Drupal with Composer. I'm gonna type Drupal slash core, find it really easily, jump over to GitHub, it's listed as the canonical repository. Uh, let's say I select the correct branch, 9x2x. I know enough to do that. Uh, and let's say that I just want to make an arbitrary change. Um, in real life, it would be a code change, but let's just make a text file change again to make this easy. So I'm going to pop open update.txt, and I'm just going to add a test string up here. So propose the change. Great, easy, create the pull request. Um, press create and I'm done. So 
of course, you and I know that uh, no tests are going to run here, no bots going to come, and no one's going to review this change. It's not going to get merged. And there's a few reasons for that. One is because uh, GitHub is not where Drupal development happens, uh, although a lot of developers might come to GitHub to find Drupal or to Packagist. Um, another is that this is a subtree split, just like uh, Symphony Console was. However, if I go to Drupal slash core recommended, which is the the parents, I think, uh, that depends, that has a dependency for core, that's not going to help me out either. So let's just imagine a few months go by, a few weeks, a few days, whatever. Uh, no one answers, and, but I really want to contribute this change upstream. So take a long shot, go to drupal.org and say, I'm going to figure this out. Where do I contribute? So I, I did figure it out, but it took me a while to figure out. I don't go to try Drupal or resources. Um, I go to build and there's a browse repository. Presumably that's the Drupal or sorry, the Drupal core repository. Um, and if I want to make a change, I'm going to navigate into the, the core subdirectory and I'm going to go to the same file I changed before update.txt use the nice GitLab edit button, uh, but I get an error, right? So even though, even if I were to sign into GitLab or GitHub in this browser, um, it's not gonna help me actually make a change to Drupal.org's GitLab. Also, I guess the change that I made is just gone. Click edit. You're not allowed to edit files. Please fork it. Okay, I'm gonna fork it. You tried to fork Project Drupal, but it failed because the namespace is not valid. I don't know what that means. When I'd probably give up um, because I'm a member of the Drupal community, I have an idea of something else that I could do. don't really know what to do next. There's no tests or anything running here. Uh, and I don't know who would merge it or when. I happen to know from experience that if I go back, if I click the issue, it'll actually take me back to drupal.org. And the tests are here. Generally, to summarize, this has been a kind of frustrating experience trying three or four different ways to attack the problem of contributing a one-line change uh, to Drupal core. And in the end, I think I figured it out by first going to the Drupal project on Drupal.org, then making an issue, then making a fork, then creating a merge request, then making the change, then coming back to Drupal.org, finding a, a test run that seems appropriate uh, and then waiting for it. Uh, I'm not sure what the next steps are. I don't know if someone's going to review this. All right. Um, I'm not sure if I'm back. Yeah, there we are. So funny, not funny, I would say. Um, it was actually really fun to go through this with Matthew. Um, and it was hard to show this video you know, I thought about should I show this video or not because uh, it's a, it's painful, but um, it's painful but not unfair to show. And so I decided I should show it. 
Um, if anything, it's a useful exercise or it's useful to teach you how to contribute and how to get over the hurdles. Um, as I mentioned, I'll share the whole video. It's I think it's maybe 25 minutes or so, and we have to reduce it to six-ish. Um, and I know I'm spending a lot of time on this in this Dries note, but again, it's the theme of the conference in a way. So anyhow, despite a lot of the great work that the Drupal Association has done, and, and they have done a lot of great work, um, they haven't had a chance to really uh, focus on that beginner experience, that initial contributor, and, and optimizing for these workflows. So if you're an existing or long-term Drupal contributor, all of the new features are awesome and, and, and really a big improvement. But if you're new to Drupal, um, that's not necessarily the case. So obviously, what we want to do here is we want to adopt GitLab in its fullest. We want to go all in, um, you know, use every feature of it uh, where it makes sense. Um, but we want to do so thoughtfully, right? So like we want to maintain all of the key features that we have in our community that make us work together so well and that allow us to scale and that allow us to do what we do. And so examples would be the credit system. Um, it's it's we're, we're really leading the world here with the credit system and 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 you know tracking how people contribute to Drupal, who contributes to Drupal, how innovation happens, and also doing or giving credit along the way. You know, giving credit is important. Uh, understanding how our community works is important. We don't want to lose the credit system. It's a really important uh, aspect of our community, and it helps us you know grow and sustain and scale the project. Same thing maybe with the tools that we use to do release management and packaging or the, the tools that we have to do update uh, notifications and update status. Uh, but then there's other things that we've built for ourselves that maybe aren't unique to what we do. And examples could be the tickets or the issues themselves uh, or how we run our test uh, runners, you know? Um, and those things we want to adopt GitLab for. You know, the things that aren't unique to Drupal that don't really add much value, we definitely want to use GitLab instead. And that would allow us to focus on the things that are unique to us and stop doing things that aren't unique to us and allow us to focus uh, some more. So um, for the next session, um, I actually wanted to uh, show you another video. I was you know, talking to Tim Lennon, our CTO, our CTO at the Drupal Association quite a bit. And, um, you know, we would meet weekly actually about this uh, for some time. And I asked Tim to put together some thoughts in a video. And I'm gonna show you uh, that video next. So let's uh, play that video. Thank you, Dries. And thanks to Matt for putting on the persona of a new contributor and putting this comparison together for us. It can be difficult to see the forest for the trees when we're so used to an existing contribution workflow. To us, it's second nature to start a Drupal contribution by using our Drupal.org accounts to open an issue. But as Matt demonstrated, a new contributor to Drupal is going to follow the patterns they've learned from other projects. So what can we do to improve the new contributor experience? Fortunately, we have a path forward. By building on our existing GitLab integration and accelerating the replacement of Drupal.org features with their GitLab counterparts. As I watched Matt's video, I grouped his findings into several categories. First category is discovery. There are now multiple entry points that a potential contributor to Drupal might find when trying to make their first contribution. These might be Packagist, the GitHub mirror for Drupal, the GitLab repository that we host, or Drupal.org itself. From each of these, we need to ensure that the contributor finds a valid path to contribution and gets gently redirected if they go astray. The solution to this is going to be putting in place in-place guidance on these third-party entry points with strong documentation and helpful bots that can redirect users to the right spot. The second category is account management and authentication. Most potential contributors will already have a GitHub or GitLab.com account. Having to create a new account on Drupal.org is an extra step. If possible, we should simplify this extra step to a one-click process so that if a user already has one of those accounts, they can use that existing account to create their Drupal.org profile and authenticate. The solution here is to develop a single sign-on authentication system for Drupal.org 
uh, and our GitLab instance that can use these existing contributor accounts from sources like github.com or gitlab.com. The third category that Matt discovered is change first versus issue first contribution. In Matt's example, a new contributor initiates their contribution by using the code editor and is directed into opening the appropriate merge request. In Symfony, the contributor is not required to start an issue to begin their contribution. This is inverted 180 degrees from how we work in Drupal. In Drupal, we always start from the issue and not from the code change. But that pattern likely doesn't match what contributors expect. Whether a user starts from the code change or from an issue, they should be able to initiate their contribution. The solution is to allow a contribution directly from the GitLab IDE, opening merge requests even without attached issues. To do this, we may need to use GitLab's issues rather than Drupal.org's custom issue tracker for its tighter integration between GitLab collaboration features and issue management. This is also going to mean that we're going to need to use solutions like GitLab scoped labels to handle the metadata that's currently used to organize the core issue queue. The fourth category is waiting for test results. After Matt makes his contribution, he goes back to look for his test results, first realizing that they're posted to the Drupal.org issue and not to the merge request, and then having, having to stumble through a user interface that offers too many options to click and doesn't make it clear that actually he's just waiting for the test results to complete. It doesn't help that Drupal core tests currently take almost an hour and a half to complete, even with dedicated 32 core machines for each test run spun up on AWS. The solution for this is to move to GitLab CI and pipelines for continuous integration in the Drupal project for its tight integration between test results and GitLab issues. We also need to work with core contributors to optimize the speed of running Drupal core tests so that they can complete faster. Finally, the last and perhaps most important category is just improving user experience and removing Drupalisms. There are key user experience questions that go unanswered in Matt's contribution attempt. Where's the right place to start my contribution? Am I following the right contribution process? When will I have my test results? Who will review my changes? What does the term issue fork mean? And are those gray bubbles test results? What about all these other links on the page? In the interest of providing all the data someone might possibly want, we often make it too easy to go down the wrong path. Solution here is to leverage tools like the support bots and automatic assignment rules that we saw in the Symphony example to show new contributors the ropes, to assign reviewers for code changes, and to communicate the next steps on a given issue. So how will we get there? By accelerating the migration to GitLab, we can address each of these issues and build on the improvements we've already made in the last year. The roadmap for these improvements will be about nine months long, assuming that we can fully dedicate two of the DA engineering team members. And unfortunately, we already had a full roadmap planned for 2021 with many other important priorities. That's why immediately following DrupalCon, we'll be starting a search process for new candidates to join the engineering team. With one hire, we hope to be able to complete these improvements in about 14 months. With two hires, we believe we should be able to complete that GitLab acceleration in only nine. We're confident in our ability to make the first hire quickly, and we're talking to partners who can help support the second hire. If you're interested in supporting this work, please reach out to the Drupal Association at drupal.org slash contact. If the initiative that Dries proposed earlier today is about making it possible to fall in love with Drupal, then I would say that this initiative is about making it possible to fall in love with Drupal contribution. Let's get there together. Awesome. Um, great video. Um, obviously, this is very important uh, stuff. Um, you know, I think we have a good plan. You saw that in, in Tim's video. We know what to do. We know how to do it. We know how to sequence it. The challenge is that with the current staffing, it would take, you know, two years, um, maybe even more than two years to get there, which, you know, as the Drupal Association board and the staff, we didn't feel great about, you know, we want to do more and we want to do it faster. And again, we know what to do. And so as Tim explained, we're looking to expand the capacity of the engineering team. Specifically, we would like to add two developers and a project manager. And we're looking for, you know, help to achieve this, you know, whether it's, you know, borrowing engineers or project managers or making a donation, a financial contribution to the Drupal Association. Um, we're going to be focused on this in the next few weeks, and hopefully we can start sort of expanding our team uh, shortly after DrupalCon. If you have the ability to help, please do contact me or Heather Rocker, and uh, yeah, we would love to chat. So, um, you know, let's replace more of our tools with GitLab. You know, I think 
Um, it will allow us to attract more contributors, also part-time contributors, people that um, just maybe like in Matthew's video, want to make a quick one-time contribution to Drupal. That should be easy. Um, I think it will benefit everyone, whether you're a long-term contributor or just getting started with Drupal. That will all lead to more innovation, faster innovation, and also us getting off the island. Uh, that's the getting of the island part in the title, uh, getting rid of our Drupalisms and embracing what other organizations and people do. So, you know, in terms of next steps, the Drupal Association will, you know, obviously lead this transition to GitLab. They do need more capacity and we're looking for help there. And secondly, I think as the community of contributors, uh, I would like to call on those people interested in helping with the project browser. Uh, let's go build that. And I think, um, you know, just to wrap it up here, I think let's keep up the momentum that we have with Drupal 9 and the adoption of Drupal 9. Let's keep working on the Drupal 10 initiatives. Those five initiatives are really important. We feel really good about it. We're making good progress overall. We do need more help to finish them on time for the Drupal 10 deadlines. Uh, but then in addition to, let's add a sixth initiative. Let's get that off the ground uh, and let's start working on a project browser. We may or may not be able to accomplish that in time for Drupal 10, but it could come shortly after Drupal 10. That's fine too. And uh, yeah, let's uh, migrate to GitLab uh, so we can attract more contributors. So. Let's make more people fall in love with Drupal. Let's convert these people to long-term contributors. And, uh, you know, Drupal will stay relevant and thriving for many, many years to come. So that's my Dries note. As I mentioned, I will be sharing the slides on my blog. That goes to drupal.org as well. Uh, and then uh, following this, I think there's like a five minute break and then we'll have a Q&A. So I think, Heather, we, I think we missed our break. So when uh, we said really? five minutes, we meant nine minutes ago. Um, but it's it's really, you know, this is really exciting. And and we're really excited at the Drupal Association to to be able to collaborate on what's next for Drupal and, and be able to step in in a really important way. And as you said, if the community, anybody in the community who's ready to help us, we, you know, we're ready to talk. So given that you all might have some questions after what was a really cool i saw in the chat best dries note ever by the mm -hmm. way i um, can't see the chat so but hey that's good to know <laughs> that's right so if you've got some questions dries and i uh will go right from here over to the q a session tim will be there too so if you want some some more information on anything just please see us there awesome all right I'll thanks see you there in a few yeah all right see everyone soon